Welcome to the SSI Orbit Podcast, a forum for conversations that explore the ever-growing ecosystems of self-sovereign identity. And I'm your host, Matsur Gnod. All right, let's start with this. A parable of the blind men and an elephant. And so it's the parable of the blind men and the elephant. And it tells the story of a group of blind men who encounter an elephant for the first time. And each man touches a different part of the elephant, such as the trunk, the leg, the tail. And they'll describe the elephant based on their limited experience, right? They can't see the whole thing being that they're blind. And so they argue about the true nature of the elephant as each person's perspective is influenced by the part they've touched. And so the moral of this story is that individuals sometimes may have limited understanding of a larger concept due to their singular perspective. And the reason why I'm starting with this is I think this parable could be related to the way people look at artificial intelligence. AI is complex, it's a multifaceted field, and people often form their opinions based on their own experiences, their background, their own knowledge. And so as a result, their understanding of AI may be limited or maybe skewed, just like the blind men's understanding of the elephant. And so maybe this is a a good way to start the conversation today. We're going to be looking at the intersection of digital trust in the age of AI, but it may be a good starting point just to talk about AI, where we're at today. I think it's become quite the mainstream thing, and there are a lot of products that are AI-based that have taken off and have seen mainstream adoption. And so we seem to be in the age of GPT-4. So with all of this, it may be interesting to just start off by giving context of where we are, what is G- GPT-4, what does all of this entail, and just level setting for where we are in the age of AI. So I think that blind man and, uh, and the elephant example is a very, uh, very good one to keep in mind. And the other analogy I uh, use is, uh, you know, the way we go, let's say, go buy a car, and uh, we, you know, if somebody who don't know too much about uh, cars and mechanics, um, you can really evaluate very much. So one thing we, we go trying to do is open the hood and see if we can see anything that meaningful. Um, the other example would be a, a neuro a doctor who uh, may be doing surgery into a, a human brain and uh, you would see what's going on. Uh, you would see the, the, all the tissues and, and everything. Uh, but you don't really uh, uh, know what are the uh, the brain thinking about. We don't really, you know, even to this day, science doesn't quite know how the brain works. And that's, you know, kind of, a, I think, a humility we should have while we try to sort of evaluate what AI is and, and isn't or what could be in the future, et cetera. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, but one thing we uh, do know is uh, GPT-4 or ChatGPT, and uh, I, I think uh, the before we um, sort of want to jump into uh, our initial response and uh, you know trying to uh, reach some kind of a conclusion, I think we should um, pause and uh, maybe uh, think about uh, what it is. And one way you can, you know, um, I, I think we can do is look at what is GPT, right? The, the three letters that, that seem to hide all the magic here. And uh, um, maybe from there, uh, see what are the potentials uh, that, that we can derive from that. And uh, the, the, the type of risks we're talking about tend to span from very immediate, like short-term risk, to media term and some very quickly jump to a lot of existential questions. I think uh, um, also the right time frame is important if we talk about this. Um, and so the recent uh, event on ChatGPT and related developments in AI really represent a jump. And this is again very. Um, uh, representative of the phenomena uh, as computing in general uh, used to uh, grow exponentially. So in the beginning of the curve, things seem to always be very slow. Uh, if we think about AI as a you know promising technology, 
It was promised back in 1950s or 60s, and people thought it's you know a, a project for a summer. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, disappointed them numerous times. Uh, but uh, exponential curve, the magic happens in the last few cycles. So I think we are starting to see that at the beginning of that cycle. And so if we keep these things in mind, I think we have a better perspective of what um, the, uh, uh, the, the future of uh, AI might be and uh, what kind of a... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, problems or issues and opportunities uh, we should uh, think of in the short and media and long-term perspective. So probably um, that's quite a lot, but uh, that's, I think, the context we should lay out first. When we look at the amount of data that gets created every year, I can't remember if there, there's a law or, or something that refers to this, but over the past years, especially with more connectivity to mobile, the amount of bandwidth and data that's just <laughs> data that gets created every year is just it's on an exponential curve. And you do wonder now with these AI systems, or if we just focus on GPT, a, a lot of what gets generated out of there is based on human inputs. But you could imagine at some point, like if, if humans are inputting prompts, and maybe it's worth just talking a bit about how these systems work through like human language prompts into these systems and that that might be interesting to discuss but i do wonder how at a certain point like human prompts are creating responses generated by an ai and then this is brand new content that will then get re-ingested by ais so you, you start to wonder what the <laughs> downstream effect of this will be at a certain point like we're generating more and more data in our everyday lives today but it's really just based on human input but that's going to just keep exponentially growing because the amount of data created, whether it's text, whether it's image, whether it's videos, deep fakes, uh, any type of just content, because you're no longer reliant on human inputs, it's just the volume is just astronomical. Yes, so um, uh, maybe it's, it's good to have a mental model of how the uh, GPT, uh, chat GPT system work today. And uh, essentially, uh, instead of you know a, a programmer writing a smart <laughs> algorithm or program, uh, these systems are based on a sort of a template that uh, 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 developers put in, and this is what we call algorithm. <clears throat> uh, but the algorithm need uh, it's not finalized. It has a huge amount of uh, parameters or, or numbers that is not finalized yet. And so that's where the training comes in. And the training requires lots of computing and a lot of data. And as we mentioned, we come to an age that we have a lot of computing, it's exponentially growing, um, and a lot of data too. So uh, it turns out like the algorithms may not need to be so sophisticated and uh, uh, be by a huge amount of computing and data tend to uh, actually make uh, the, the match work. The other part I think we should also sort of uh, understand uh, ahead of time is that these systems are really, um, uh, think of it as a, a three-step process. So you have a pre-trained model or people call a large language model. These are pre-trained and use, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it self learns, right? Uh, using uh, all the text output that the humans uh, have generated in the past thousands of years of history. And all these that is pre-trained into a large language model. Then you have a fine tuning step, which is really putting our touch into sort of like what we want, right? This is the question of what kind of system do we want? What is good? What is, you know, uh, unethical and stuff like that uh, need to be fine tuned into uh, the model to make it actually quote unquote, useful to us and minimize the harmfulness of potentials there. The third step is then you use applications. And so all, most of us currently uh, experience the applications through a chatbot, ChatGPT is a user interface. And this portion are typically not uh, what we think of as AI, this portion are regular software. 
And uh, for um, integration into Microsoft Bing, that would uh, basically integrate in this language model to a search engine. And so that would be another way to experience it. Or you can put into, you know, Office and documents, etc. Um, but all of these essentially are um, important to us because we experience the language model typically not directly, but through another layer of software. Um, and it's very important that that layer of software has all the issues that uh, you know regular software will still have, and uh, uh, it could also change how we. Uh, eventually access the language model. It's, we, we never directly access it. It's always through another layer of software. So uh, that gives us, I think, something to talk about where we, if we you know, think about uh, trust issues and, and, uh, and the privacy and, and, uh, and you know, any aspects of these questions, uh, keep that in mind because it's not just a language model, but also many of the other software that that eventually we will interact and use. And these layers of software is, will do filtering and they'll create desired user experiences and I, I guess not create certain types of content responses based on, on its rule engine type of thing. But if you look at the LLM that you say is pre-trained and underneath, is it comparable to a protocol? And because pe people, although they don't typically interact directly with protocols, you could still directly interact with protocols for certain things. Do you see a world where people interact directly with the LLM? Like, is this something that should be an open protocol um, that people have the ability to interact with directly? Or how do you see this all playing out? Currently, there are at least three levels like we were talking about, we can use as an end user through a uh, application like ChatGPT or search engine. We could also go program through some kind of API. So uh, I think OpenAI opens up um, the GPT 3.5 has an API you can program to it. Essentially, that will allow a developer to write a application like ChatGPT. So you could have a you know specialized chatbot or specialized search engine um, uh, to integrate the the use of lang lang large language models. Uh, so that's the second level. That would be definitely a kind of a protocol. That's the interface that the, we, uh, the developer could then interact with uh, these, this model to, uh, directly, more directly, right? It's still uh, uh, regulated. And so it will be a, a fair question how that API should look like and how do we regulate them? You know, if one, I want to my application to be able to switch from one large language model to another, for example, and that API is important. And the third portion would uh, go even a step deeper. Um, so there are a lot of the uh, potential one can do is that in the pre-trained model, we, we know, know that about you know, fine tuning to so that you could uh, make the model do things what we want, right? Essentially give it a uh, regulated behavior of the, the pre-trained model. And so that pre-training, sorry, fine-tuning step uh, could also be opened up. And so fine-tuning, I believe this would uh, be less open at the moment, but that could also happen. So, so a developer could take the pre-trained model and then add your own data set. And this, these data set for fine-tuning are relatively small. And so, and you know, many of the companies and, and commercial entities, uh, developers could do uh, this step themselves. And uh, so, people, for example, have been uh, looking at using proprietary data, let's say, in a in a financial setting, to produce a you know a chatbot that specializes in financial knowledge, and that would be a, a type of application that is also possible. So all these. Um, and you know, if we want to push further beyond, we will get into data set and what kind of data set we um, would do for, uh, for the uh, pre-trained stage itself, right? So that would be further beyond that. And so a lot of these interfaces uh, could be think of as a protocol and it would be fair to ask, you know, who designed this protocol and what should or shouldn't be part of it. One of my early thinkings when seeing these systems in use, and we could think beyond just giving text inputs and getting text outputs, but there's also all sorts of deep fakes that are happening 
now are just simulations, whether it's just an image or a video or e even voice. So all these different types of contents are able to be created based on certain prompts and certain inputs. And the fir first thing that I, I thought about, and this is a problem that we, I don't think, still have widely solved in the digital identity or digital trust space, but is just being able to bi-directionally authenticate between two parties. And not being able to do that leads to tons of basically tons of fraud in the world today. And the first thing I thought about with all of this AI and deep fake stuff is like, oh, the <laughs> the amount of like spam telephone calls that you get, or you could even imagine the people, and it tends to sadly happen to, to more elderly people that get phone calls and people pretend to be a family member of theirs. And it's just a scam to be able to, to get them to send money or, or to, to do something that oh my God, all this is going to get exponentially worse because now that you're able to kind of just on, on a very little amount of voice data. So with all these podcasts that are out there today, someone could easily <laughs> just uh, mimic my voice and then deploy uh, some, um, some, some scams pretending to be me. Please don't do it. But um, someone will be able to easily do that. And then, you know, just calling someone and asking for money, now you're able to do it and pretend that you're someone that the person has a relationship with. So you start thinking about, wow, all this type of content authentication. So we're talking about authentication, whether it's like voice authentication, and you could think about, I don't know how popular it is anymore, but some years ago, there were a lot of deployments through interactive voice response or IVR systems where they would authenticate based on your voice. So voice authentication, even bio, different biometric authentications, authentication through video, these things kind of seem like they're they're all dead today. And so what, like, first of all, should should we be worried about this? There's never like all good or all, all bad. There's always positives and, and negatives, and it's just about dealing with these things. But it does seem like it, these systems do cause some risks and maybe one of the immediate business risk is for <laughs> any company that offers authentication services based on content it seems like that's kind of dead could you kind of explain kind of how you're looking at that landscape and how we should be transitioning from an authentication perspective sure yeah uh so this is a uh, you know uh, i think um i usually like to go you know, back to the very basics. So the phone example is really good. So if we uh, sort of uh, put away these um, professional terms like authentication, right? You know, we, we define authentication in this very rigid and uh, um, narrow sense. But let's think about how we do that task in our daily lives. And uh, the, the phone example is extremely good because most of the time we don't ask people passwords. <laughs> we pick up a phone and we listen to a voice and we naturally almost implicitly, uh, you know, do a authentication in our head. And uh, uh, that's sufficient for us most of the time. But I think AI is going to make these kind of uh, implicit authentication extremely difficult. And this implicit authentication happens all the time. And uh, you know, one of the things we uh, also feel very rely on is a, uh, a paper document. So a driver license or a passport. And if you think of it, um, a driver license is fundamentally rely on a human's ability to look at a person and a picture a, a very small photo <laughs> um, and make a determination if you know this photo and the picture uh, uh, sorry and the person or uh, uh, the, the photo is the you know this same person as the, the one presenting it and that that task is getting harder and harder as uh, uh, AI is able to produce these very vivid looking uh, really photographs or videos that is uh, uh, we, we cannot uh, tell the difference. Um, so uh, once we cross that line, I think a lot of the uh, um, mechanisms we use our, in our daily lives um, can no longer uh, be relied upon. And uh, 
once the uh, these kind of presentations are remote, and uh, we will be seeing a push towards where that comparison would happen. So in the in the end, the only way we can recognize whether this picture is authentic or not is not by the what's contained in the content in the picture itself, but rather how the picture was produced. And that will be the only way to, to tell the difference. Um, so it is, it is a, a humbling to think where uh, AI is going in this direction. So today, um, you know, there's a lot of people doing demos and et cetera on this. Um, but I think one of the technology um, development I want to highlight, which may, you know, help us to conclude this is uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to rely on that anymore. As you can say, quantum-based authentication is dead um, because uh, ChatGPT today um, already has the so-called multi-model support. Uh, so today, you know, if, if someone wants to uh, produce a picture, you would use like Midjourney um, and Wally, et cetera, right? So there are different uh, uh, ap uh, applications and that, that are separate from uh, ChatGPT. But GPT-4 start to integrate this thing too. And it's, it is important to understand that the GPT learning is what we call a, a representation learning. It, it learns the information in a very high dimension of space. And essentially, um, it, you know, every English word or a token would be represented as a um, extremely fine-grained high dimensional uh, vector. And this vector is, it, you can think of it as a coordinate in this magical space. Um, and then you can reason about it within that space. And the great thing about this kind of a knowledge representation is that then you can think of like image uh, the same way as world. So image uh, can be also represented with some kind of points or maybe a set of points. And uh, um, uh, so uh, one would be able to say, um, you know, one of the recent example would be that you, you present a very iconic photo, let's say, and you say, I would call this a particularly given name, right? That's my um, Ansel Adams um, as, a, as, a, as a new concept. And uh, the, uh, the AI model would be able to remember that concept and use that concept interweaved with text and image and combine them all together. So you can say, well, you know, take my picture and please make it look like that. And, and so it's actually creating new concepts that way. Um, one of the most recent um, study shows about uh, brain scans. So you could have um, brain scan image or data being encoded exactly in this same space. And this high dimensional space then becomes all the knowledge what is in there, whether it's visual, audio, um, and you know, including our neural activities in our brain, um, be represented in some kind of vector and they can interact with each other. So you would be able to look at the, a, a brain scan and uh, interpret what the person is thinking and vice versa. Uh, so, this uh, is the, I think, the way the future is going. And this uh, point to us, I think we can quite certainly conclude that this kind of uh, implicit quantum-based uh, authentication uh, can no longer be relied upon. And that does not mean, you know, just the high-tech portion of it, but any day-to-day -day, uh, activity like a phone uh, conversation, we will need some other way to be able to tell whether the person on the other side uh, is what we think, it, you know, um, is it, our friend. I gave the example earlier of human text inputs going into an AI and eventually it gets AI inputs <laughs> becoming outputs and you're able just to create more and more content. But then if you even start thinking about, hey, like rather than just relying on, on human text input, if I'm relying on images or if I'm relying on video or if I'm even relying on data inputs coming from a brain scan, the amount of inputs will just exponentially increase in themselves and just continue making, you know, stronger and stronger outputs out of these AIs. And so you, you start to think, and this was a comment that came from 
my good friend Tim Boma, who uh, is part of the Trust Over IP Foundation. Uh, he's also Director of uh, Verification and Assessments at the Digital Governance Council, um, kind of saying that it feels like we're in a pre-IP stage where you don't know necessarily where things are going with digital trust protocols, but one thing that's for sure is that everything is going to have to be signed and if it, it needs to be considered authentic. So just like COVID accelerated digital transformation and the move to remote work and a bunch of other stuff. It seems like AI is really going to advance the adoption of digital signatures absolutely everywhere. Is is that the way we're going in? Do you, and do you think that's the ultimate solution of kind of building some form of a root of trust uh, and not having to rely on content for authentication? Um, yes and no. So let's think about the yes portion. Um, like the example we were uh, talking about earlier, if the you know the picture or the photo cannot be authentic, uh, cannot be used for authentication, then the alternative is basically uh, going all the way back to trace where the photo is taken. And so, um, so one way we will see, for for instance, in the facial uh, based recognition based uh, authentication in a smartphone, for example would we'll trace all the way back to make sure that the camera embedded in your phone are authenticated. And so this essentially goes into the um, what's known as the um, provenance, right? So instead of the content, you want to track the provenance along with the content, of course. And so the provenance, uh, uh, if, if, again, you know, if you want to think about a, let's say a, a banking um, app, that they want to know it, it is actually the, the, the real user. And currently you would maybe use a facial recognition algorithm to say, hey, this is the person, but that can be subject to a uh, known as, um, I think, injection attack, right? So you could, uh, a, a attacker could uh, run a uh, mobile app um, uh, simulator and pretend to be that simulator and then inject any kind of a photo they want and so they could, you know, cops get a photo from your uh, social media feed, and then pretend to be you. Um, and that would be rather uh, uh, quite simple to uh, to um, to launch uh, such an app today. The so the the way out of that would be basically um, uh, secure the actual device. So basically, you will have a liveness test to make sure that it is actually coming from. Uh, current, um, uh, the content was newly produced, that it is on a phone that had been authenticated. So the device itself need to be authenticated. And, and presumably you also need the protocols to make sure this information that uh, if it's true locally on your phone, then be represented remotely to the um, relying party or the, the verifier, right? And so that, that has to be end to end. Um, uh, so that will be, I, I guess, the um, uh, the immediate response to the, the question you posed. However, I would think that this approach only takes care of a very um, small um, uh, part of the overall problem, I believe, um, because we, uh, I, again, we tend to focus very much on the protocol layer and on the narrow definition of authentication, but um, we use um, numerous other ways and they are all over the place that, that we implicitly authenticate people. Um, if these, um, you know, um, uh, phishing schemes, or I, I think the new terms of cat phishing, um, um, is, uh, is also called, um, pick butchering. <laughs> uh, there's many ways that uh, with um, uh, this synthetic AI generated uh, content, one can you know, create personalities or presence or identity right? uh, that is uh, quite uh, real. Um, uh, so you could even have history, have interactions. And uh, um, uh, so in the end, I think we are facing a much bigger problem than the narrow issue that we talk about in content authenticity, uh, because uh, we now have to, uh, in any moment of uh, any kind of uh, online or digital life, 
be a, a you know be, be be cautious about who are we dealing with or what are we reading, and that is uh, beyond I think any person can do. So um, the um, identity and uh, like uh, you know the, the community we work with in in the lower layer. Um, often put the veracity or truthfulness of content away from uh, our uh, technology design. I think that's a mistake. I think we have to open up the uh, broader scope of the issues of how do we uh, produce or um, ensure that the knowledge or the information and data we are sharing are authentic. Uh, so this is uh, truthfulness or factualness, right? So all these are important and they really, it is where that real authentication is going to happen in the future. Um, so it will go beyond sort of in the lower protocol layer, but in the much higher, I think it's also beyond the so-called semantic layer. That's because semantics are very structured data. Um, the AI actually can take uh, much better uh, in raw data rather than structured data. And, uh, um, uh, and, and so, uh, this, so this system essentially overleap us, you know, in this so-called uh, layered approach to, uh, to data, but all the way up to the, the meaning and, uh, you know, our, um, our intellectual thinking um, personality, and that will be the layer of the problem that we need to deal with in the future. I like the nuanced answer you have. Um, it's it's great to hear a couple different perspectives there. And then, so so, so does that maybe make us re rethink? I know this is a topic that you find quite interesting. Is just thinking about the more broader sense of identity, where professionals in the space tend to focus a lot on like from a technical perspective what an identity is but that's not necessarily how we feel or think about our identities and so does does the framing or the way we look at identity maybe impact our thinking in stuff like authentication like we're just talking about where perhaps it needs to be at different layers or higher level layers or beyond semantic layers. Um, does rethinking the broader sense of identity help us get some better framing of, of how we're going to have to adapt to this new reality? Yeah, maybe, you know, this is a big, big question. So maybe I, I would just start with something um, sort of uh, simpler, uh, but basically pointing out that the approach we need to take, right? And, and then we can follow up on that. Um, the uh, if you recall, like the early artificial intelligence studies, research uh, back in the uh, definitely the 60s and most of the 70s and, and 80s are on um, uh, either uh, what's known as a symbolic right, or logic. And so we are trying to think of a intelligent uh, behavior of a system as following some type of logic. A very interesting way of think about it. Um, so in psychology, this will be um, uh, the conscious way of thinking about problems. Uh, it turns out, in, and and also you know, beginning of uh, neural networks happened maybe in late um, eighties, and then later on, you know, the real thing happened and way in twenty tens. Um, that uh, uh, it turns out that it's much easier to have the machine to learn uh, knowledge from the raw material rather than that humans construct intermediary layers for them. And so the machines does much better if you give it the original information directly and let it to construct a proper intermediary layers and themselves. And those layers tend to be much more nuanced, accurate, and uh, rich in information. So it is essentially saying that humans are really not very good at this job. Uh, the machine algorithms can do much, much better. And so think about it for a moment, right? What does that mean? That means that a lot of complex problems, especially problems related to human intelligence 
and uh, how we um, uh, solve complex social problems, uh, problems that is uh, we consider um, sometimes natural, but very, very hard. So these problems, uh, it turns out it's easier for a data-driven approach and let machine to learn from it and uh, essentially construct or do the programming themselves rather than we inject into some kind of a, a formula. And uh, uh, so if we take that principle into the question of identity, I think, so I can think of like the identity we constructed so far are very much like a human constructed design, right? We want to say here is, you know, um, a identity problem, which is uh, in the broad sense, very complex, has a lot of factors. And we simplify it by saying, oh, you know, we could, we can solve all the problem, but so we think that this is very important. We need to, you know, have a, um, <laughs> a pair of keys and do signatures and do proofs, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that's our design of how the system ought to work. And uh, um, then we say, hey, you know, we have a wonderful tool. And we don't know whether these tools will solve the eventual problem, the end problem properly. We don't know whether our customers will like to use it, whether they will actually make, you know, um, fake news go away. We don't know for sure. We will have to wait because that's a domain we consider outside of our reach. And if we think about the, the uh, AI analogy, uh, if we really want to solve these very social and human problems, it might be easier to um, follow the uh, AI's, uh, um, you know, trajectory of technology and maybe use lear machine learning methods to, um, uh, for us to actually all the way go to uh, a stage that we can actually address the final problem, the real problem that, uh, that uh, you know, consumers and, and, uh, and citizens of the world will face. Um, and so that, that I think it is a, um, it's a, it's a new thing. And, uh, um, but I think we should think about that and we should learn from the, uh, you know, how the AI um, progress happened. Um, and, and especially if we would be dealing with a, uh, many of the agents that's gonna be AI powered in the world, and we will be, you know, dealing with that fact. I think our solutions would also need to look into that direction. So hopefully, that is, you know, a very high level idea. I think um, that will be. Uh, I hope that will be a, um, a a new direction and topic that uh, our community can, um, you know, pay more attention to. One of the things that I have personally realized in my interactions or usage of these AI or GPT systems is just the level of trust or openness that we have towards bots versus the level of openness and trust that we have towards other people. And I remember reading about this some years back and it was just talking from the perspective of Google search, just saying like the amount that Google knows about you personally, like they know stuff about you that you don't know about you just because of what you're sharing with it. It's able to um, draw different things together that maybe, you know, you're not able or capable of thinking about or you just haven't thought about. But it seems like the level of content or trust that we're injecting into these bots is, is even more than what we would be injecting into uh, a search feature, for example. And that that could be all sorts of personal things. It could be all sorts of proprietary things about like yourself, your organization. And so it's interesting if you think about like our our, our identities and within the whole concept of how we form trust, it's, it's often based on the type of relationship that we have with with another person right like over time as you form a, a deeper relationship you form more trust with someone and then that will make you do things that maybe you wouldn't have done earlier on in your relationship but the speed at which you're able to form a relationship with a bot and the amount that you're giving the bot it feels like it's much easier to build trust between a human and a bot than it is between 
to humans. Would you say that's an accurate statement? And then what, like, what implications would this have in, in the future of relationships between humans and bots? Yes, I, I think uh, this is a great point. And a lot of people start to realize this might be a more um, a harder dilemma to face because um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a paradox that uh, we tend to, well, a lot of people trust computers somehow more <laughs> than trusting a human. And um, it's very interesting and uh, why this phenomena exists. And actually, I, I think uh, one of the time I asked this question to ChatGPT and, and it gave me you know, a very nice answer. And so one of the, uh, you know, a, a, um, I, I think a quote I want to use is um, by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. He says, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. And so we have, uh, humans have, you know, developed lots of language to describe our own behavior and, uh, you know, trust, um, emotions and numerous things, right? Uh, we don't have the same kind of language to describe a man-made, um, but quite intelligent behaving at least um, system. And so we simply use the exactly same terms. And sometimes we want to use a adjective to sort of modify it. Um, and, uh, uh, but we basically are making uh, these terms as we go along and naturally uh, none of these are um, accurate, right? So intelligent, we, we talk about the system we build and intelligent as in for a, a human being are quite different, but we don't have a word to tell the difference. Or you know, a lot of times we also not only don't have the language, but we don't have um, the capability to tell the difference. But the language is important because that's, if we create a term, I think there's a, some call, somebody called uh, pseudo cognition. <laughs> uh, whatever the term is, that will uh, help us to create a culture of understanding the difference. It's very important that all of us, right, not just the, you know, uh, techies and, and experts, but everybody who have a common and the widespread knowledge of the difference between the two. Uh, much more nuanced and uh, accurate recognition of such difference. I think that will come with some language and some culture uh, along with it. Um, with that, I think today we've been sort of accustomed to understand a, a computer program as a service offered by some company, usually, and or large organizations, etc. And so our trust is really based on uh, competency, you know, whether it's reliable, it can give me solve the problem I'm seeking. And um, uh, I wouldn't be too surprised that, that uh, we intuitively feel that the system is giving us reliable um, <laughs> answers to our questions uh, more than um, maybe from a you know average person, right? So that wouldn't be surprising. And so it would be would not be too surprising that uh, people tend to trust this machine intelligence or um, a, a computer program more readily than. Um, than to a average, uh, especially a stranger. And, um, but that's because we don't quite understand how the system works. So our assumptions are based on our past experience. And uh, uh, so it will be very intuitive to feel like uh, people will have uh, developed relationships with these things because we think of them in terms of human beings, in terms of how we interact with another you know, intelligent being. Uh, we don't have a conceptualized um, um, understanding of what these things are. Uh, we very quickly forget that these systems are built by other humans and they could you know, turn it off, they could change it, or they could even maliciously manipulate it. And all that is wide open possibility out there. Uh, we've never factored those points in. 
And so one of the paradox here is that as the system gets better and better, um, uh, we will be trusting it more and more and we'll be actually falling into this cycle and uh, maybe very much over-trusting and over-rely on it uh, over the long term. There is also a um, further question um, on these systems and what we want them to be. Um, so naturally, most of the time we've been compare, uh, we've been complaining that this agent, you know, don't can follow my uh, conversation. We complain that their uh, language was does not have emotion, etc. I uh, I think we are um, misleading ourselves of what we want. You know, let me ask you, like, do you want a um, intelligent agent to be like uh, uh, the character data in, you know, um, Star Trek, right? Or somebody feel purely human and give you all the nuances and, 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 and uh, emotion cues, et cetera. It's a dangerous thought, uh, you know, I, I think our technology is getting very close to actually produce that if we want it. But that will really be um, a, uh, I think a dangerous um, idea um, because that will, uh, most of us will not be able to tell the difference. Um, and if we are pushing towards that kind of a want, then that kind of a system will appear one day. And uh, we are already very hard to tell the difference between the bot and, and the human. Um, are the tools available for us to do that systematically so that it can you know, benefit or uh, help most people uh, understand it are already very limited. And I think that is a, is a, is a direction that we should be careful, um, you know, be careful what we want. <laughs> uh, let me put it that way. Yeah, we're talking about a lot of possible risks here. Uh, I think there's there's tons of, of benefits that come with these advancements and technologies, and we're just starting to see the the beginning of them. Um, I think just the effect it, it is already having and is going to have on human productivity and um, allowing humans to continue kind of the shift to working on more creative stuff rather than like manual or administrative stuff is is going to be cool to to keep seeing, but we often focus on a lot of the the short term um, issues or risks, and I, I don't think we've even seen the beginning over the next few years. It's I can only imagine the amount of stories and stuff that are going to come out in the media, um, negative stories around people that have been affected or things things that have happened with these technologies. But I think it's just as we're we're talking through this, although. Um, it's interesting to talk about the risks because <laughs> we want to make sure we're we're covering the risks accordingly. Like there, there's just so much benefit with these things. But I think like I guess like talking about risk, I, I guess like the reason why humans maybe have more trust towards these things is just the perception of risk that you have towards these things. I don't necessarily think that if if I divulge some information to a bot, like the same thing would happen um, versus if I divulged it to another human. And so I kind of have more trust in that. And then in the digital trust space, I think there's a big open source movement where, when it comes to standards that we use, when it comes to uh, technology protocols and implementations that we use, there's a big push towards open source because that just inherently creates more trust if we're trying to build these digital trust systems and we want to have common interoperable infrastructure and we need a lot of the stuff to be public utilities or public good, it's very important that we have a, a large open source model to it. And so do you think that, and I think this is probably a nuanced answer that you'll likely give, but what would be some pros and some cons of looking at an open source model for these LLMs or broader systems that we're, we're dealing with today? Yeah, uh, I think the, the the nuanced answer is the, is the right question. So let's start with the, the, the um, I think the obvious ones and the good ones are first. Um, uh, open source 
and also you know open research and publishing uh, research papers um, and allowing other researchers to be able to reproduce etc um, I think is crucial it um, because the these models are already very hard to understand and uh, I know there's a lot of people pushing for it and demanding that it, may, it must be explainable or interpretable etc but uh, remember, uh, if we think about uh, intelligent behavior you know, for human beings, right? Um, most of our behavior are very hard to explain. And uh, so explanations uh, most of the times are just uh, uh, justifications. <laughs> A lot of times we are making some kind of argument. It's not conclusive, but it's, uh, it, it makes that the process, I guess, uh, to sharing that kind of argument with each other. Um, and so I think that behavior or that kind of uh, explainability uh, or lack of thereof are going to continue or maybe getting even worse. And so it is very fundamental that the trust is not based on so-called proof or explain. Um, we're not going to be able to explain um, a, a complex system's behavior. We will need to, however, however be able to evaluate in some way and therefore open knowledge and uh, you know transparency of the model and uh, being able to, to verify or check the model um, are very important right some kind of accountability some kind of a, a shared responsibility to guard um, against a negative um, uh, you know the, the dark side or downsides and so those are all very important and that means open publication of research and open innovation and, um, you know, in terms of code and data, open source, right? So open source allow people to, uh, for example, devote their energy into testing against dangerous behavior, for instance. Um, and that has been the case for AI research um, up to this point. But I think the release of ChatGPT changed that. And all of a sudden, this is uh, uh, probably the biggest uh, um, commercial and uh, competitive uh, um, technology out there in the world. Um, so um, naturally, you will see that people are trying to lock up uh, data sets. People would not no longer disclose a lot of information. And the kind of a, a checking by the entire or bigger community are uh, um, going away. And so that, that is a, a very worrisome um, problem. The um, other part of it that the people um, start to arguing, and this is a familiar argument, I would say, is that these technologies are so powerful, um, they want to. Um, avoid or prevent that go fall into the wrong hands, so-called, right? So because they could be abused and all these, and all technology in that way, it's, it's like that it can be abused. And people then trying to think of like, how do we control this? And open source would allow, you know, anybody, including all the fraudsters and, and uh, bad actors uh, have access to this very powerful technology. And, and, and that would be, a um, significant risk as well. And so the question then becomes to how do we manage the um, accessibility of this technology? And uh, this is where I think a lot of uh, past examples we have um, in um, biotechnology. And you know, you, you probably remember gene editing is one of those. Uh, and uh, even earlier, it will be like a nuclear technology. Uh, it's one of these. And uh, um, uh, they have a good point of sort of like a, trying to set up or have a common uh, debate um, about what these things are to be. Um, and also come to a, um, uh, I think a more comprehensive and societal, democratic way of uh, you know, governance and managing these technologies. And so that need to happen in some way. Um, 
uh, at this point, it seems like uh, there's uh, there's a uh, you know lack of uh, consensus or lack of uh, uh, any urgency on this issue. And so at the moment, there are a, a few years ago there are uh, similar recognitions, and uh, we we do have uh, I know like in. Um, uh, in, in the past, uh, you know, I don't remember exactly which year now, but maybe 10, 20 years ago, there was a conference here in, in Monterey on AI ethics and uh, what are to be, et cetera, uh, very similar to how gene editing and that sort of the uh, work uh, is uh, based upon. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of discussions going on, but I'm, I don't see any... Um, coordinated and organized um, effort uh, in this uh, in this topic and uh, so I'm not very um, optimistic unfortunately on um, how this would go and uh, the default I would see is that people will go into the competitive mode right um, you know both we already see how competitive um, Microsoft and Google are and uh, um, so far, they seem to be trying to take the responsible um, uh, approach towards this. But you know, we never know how, um, as this thing heats up and more and more dollars have been involved, uh, it will be hard to tell. And uh, government regulation um, is uh, slow and lacking. Um, there's a, a European Union has a AI Act. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a very um, Good approach to uh, to at least try, um, but um, you know the, this is a very open and dynamic um, situation right now, and I think it's very concerning. Yeah, and then at, but at the same time, to, on the other side, I think if um, governments across the world or just generally people across the world like have somewhat similar beliefs of what's good and what. <laughs> what's bad and <laughs> even you, you talked about like gene editing and stuff like that I, I think there's one one example of a human cloning happening and that person is in prison today so and that okay. ha hasn't ha hasn't happened again and so i wonder like if if there are nefarious actors that start using this stuff i mean um there probably will be more alignments across the world than than people people would think with this but it will be interesting to see yeah like uh, how this model shapes out um with open source versus proprietary and speaking of proprietary one, one of the things that we started seeing and um just these gpt models or llms that are trained with large sets of public data well what becomes interesting now and where you could create new value with these systems is if you plug in proprietary data sets and so it seems like the, the movement right now in the AI space is everyone is trying to do any single type of integration possible to plug these systems into different proprietary databases or applications or systems so that you're able to leverage data sets that are proprietary to you and into these models and have these models help orchestrate whatever you're trying to do. So I wonder, and this is maybe in contrast to what we talk about in the digital trust space a lot, where like we're in a lot of senses advocating for the separation of protocols and applications and there's a lot of areas today where these are blended together social media being kind of an example of that and being stuck in kind of proprietary silos not being able to port your relationships uh, across different applications is something that we're you know hopeful in the future that we could fix and it's even more true when it comes to your identity data that you you want to have the control of where your data sits and I don't know if I have relationships in one place I should be able to to take them elsewhere so that really pushes the separation of the the protocol from the client or the end application but I wonder now with the value of these big proprietary data sets you're seeing companies that have these big data sets saying hey wait a minute I don't necessarily want all of these AI models to be able to to use my data for free. Uh, this this is valuable, and I, I want to start charging for it. And so they're setting prices for it. And so I, I wonder if this and it just reinforces the value of like good quality proprietary data 
if that kind of slows down the shift of really separating the protocol from from the end application and we're really going to see a reinforcement of proprietary closed systems yeah uh, another great question and uh, um i think people don't know how this would go one thing uh, based on you know history is that um a algorithm or technology uh, won't be lockups for long so i would assume that um gpt4 like um uh, models would uh, be recreated one day by open source um, and, and open you know, data sets. Um, so this technology eventually will uh, leave out and become widely available for as a, uh, you know, to, to almost uh, to, to most people, right? And, and so it is a question of um, knowing that how do we want to guide the, the the path where these technologies should go. Uh, in the shorter term, I think you, your, uh, your question uh, may, may lead to, in short term, like we are saying today, uh, many companies are uh, very, I think, uh, feverishly working on exactly what you just talked about. So uh, if, if somebody has a, um, uh, in, you know, they already have a private data set, uh, minimum, they can use that private data set as a fine tuning step in, uh, on, on top of the pre-trained model and therefore create a, you know, another uh, chatbot, but specialized on certain area. Um, you could uh, be a customer support, you could do diagnostics, you could uh, uh, do, you know, uh, financial <laughs> education uh, um, um, and, and uh, school learning, all of that are very rapidly ongoing. And so we will probably see commercial products out of that kind of a approach uh, in the coming, uh, if, you know, if, if not weeks, <laughs> at least in, in months or, or years, we, we will probably see that very, very soon. Um, and a lot of them are already in, uh, in experimentation stage today, but uh, we will probably see the, uh, uh, you know, commercial product they become widespread um, on these ones. And, and then further step would it be, so that will encourage people, you know, lock up a specialized knowledge. But the pre-trained model is based on the, um, today in a way, it's based on very generic and high level, um, openly accessible, mostly openly accessible data sets. Um, so with enough time and, 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 uh, and effort, uh, one can reproduce that. And it's also good to have a pre-trained model based on that because uh, to me, that sets some boundary on the behavior of the, of the model itself because it is based on these data set that, that we know. Um, it would be actually more dangerous to have uh, a a fundamentally different kind of a data training set that we would not be able to judge. Uh, so one benefit of a very large um, data set, you know, with trillions of tokens <laughs> um, is that it's hard to blue that pool um, significantly. Um, so you could say that, you know, this, this model is really learned or trained based on all large amount of uh, human knowledge uh, in history. And uh, if we assume most humans are good in nature um, and most of the writings are good in nature, um, then we probably have some confidence that the, 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 you know, the pre-trained model itself um, have something built into it for that. Um, if we actually allow um, a, a, you know, a pretty much opaque uh, training process, then that we will lose the side of what that model looked like. And so that will be a much darker thought, uh, I think, or risk um, in the you know, long-term um, development of this technology. Yeah, so maybe in the short term, just like folks used to say data is the new oil, maybe <laughs> data is the new lithium or whatever is <laughs> the, the new oil today. Um, <laughs> In, in the short term, um, just as we wrap up here, what are some interesting areas of research that are capturing your, your thinking and time and 
you do lead a task force in the Trust Over IP Foundation um, called AI and Metaverse Task Force. So what, what are some of the, the common discussions and frameworks that are being built today? or And maybe what are some interesting research or uh, thought-provoking things that you've come across lately? Yeah, so I... I, I uh, personally, uh, I'm helping uh, in, in two areas. Like one is the AI Metaverse uh, Task Force, which really trying to produce um, a first set of uh, sort of white papers along uh, to highlight these problems. And I think uh, the first point I want to, maybe the most important one is the, the one I've been emphasizing here in, in our uh, talk here, is that uh, we as a community should, uh, um, I think, um, get away from purely on uh, designing a, uh, a protocol, uh, especially a protocol based on um, assumption that may no, uh, no longer be true. Um, and we should embrace, I think, our uh, high level responsibility of creating you know, real trust and uh, trustworthiness in, in our digital systems uh, that includes um, how humans, uh, what we you know, interact in, in real life and how we um, consume content. And so that I think is a very uh, crucial differentiation. I think that uh, hopefully can guide us uh, in the long-term what we should be working on. Uh, the second part of uh, these um, studies is to identify really the interactions uh, of uh, future, um, whether you know you call it web, social, or internet, right? Uh, so uh, uh, we Im imagine the uh, the face of a, a metaverse where we are more immersed in the system. Um, that's you know little by little that's happening. We are getting uh, spending more and more time digitally. And so we have a lot of uh, behavior because digital world, unlike in physical world, um, uh, the, the distance doesn't matter much. Uh, it's considered a one single world. So if uh, people say, oh, you know, Twitter is a town square. Well, it is a gigantic town square with uh, billions of people <laughs> uh, in it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, all the behavior or the things we do in that kind of space it's in a way public, um, observable at least to somebody. And um, uh, so research, there's a lot of research that uh, um, found out that you can identify a person uniquely with extremely high um, confidence level uh, simply by observing its behavior. You mentioned earlier, Google knows, potentially knows more than us. Um, and uh, about ourselves, right? And so similarly that uh, in, 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 a, in a metaverse world, the, the physical actions, the how you walk and how do you, you know, how your motion look like, uh, all of that um, would be uh, sufficient to a very uh, highly uh, capable system to identify you. And so all of these, again, live in the, content world, live in the semantic world, whether you encrypt, whether you sign something, whether you um, have you know, clever protocols to keep your privacy, et cetera, actually doesn't matter. Because so when you communicate with another party, you are disclosing. Um, so uh, we need to remember that the amount of information we disclose uh, just by the um, you know participating in these systems are enormous, right? And uh, we may be able to regulate, for example, the you know how the uh, social media treat um, this kind of data, but um, uh, the the algorithms can still be able to digest and um, and and, and uh, reach conclusions uh, without uh, violating any of the rules and regulations. So. When we tend to think of the PII, the, you know, the, the uh, information is about our name, our um, birthdays, and, <laughs> and maybe you know, social security numbers, et cetera. But really, um, with uh, AI capabilities, um, anything, any behavior, any um, 
publicly observable um, information, including our real, you know, with, with the cameras in so many places, our actions in public space, physical space, are uh, all need to be considered as PII because they can uniquely identify us. And uh, I think that day is uh, already uh, on way to become reality. And so we, we want to basically work on point these out and hopefully uh, influence the community in general to pay attention and maybe put our priority in these areas. Thanks for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. To step to speed with future episodes or to catch up on ones you may have missed, make sure to check out the SSI Orbit podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or wish to see someone in particular on a future episode, you can find me by searching Metzger Glowed on LinkedIn or Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll get back to you. See you all next time. Thank you.